Each case is totally different. I can't give you an exact time frame of how long it will take your case, but I can explain how long it takes based on phases. The first phase is your treatment phase. I don't know how long it takes you to get well, but that's the first phase. The second phase is a phase where we're gathering medical records, medical bills, and everything, and sending it to the insurance company for processing. The third phase deals with negotiations. Sometimes that's short, sometimes that's long. Negotiations break down, we're into the trial process. If you file your case in the general district court, you'll probably have a hearing in about four or five months. Those cases cannot get any more than $25,000. If you file your case in circuit court, the sky's the limit. You can ask for any amount you want. It will take between eight to 10 months to get a verdict. Understand that at any point through this process, your case can settle. There's still settlement negotiations going on even though the court process is working. So if the case settles, the court process is over. The most important part is for the client to treat with his or her doctor and get well. We will take care of everything else. And good evening, everybody. It's your boy Cruz, the Beast from the East Cruz Inc. Radio 102.8 TV Live. It is 7.32 here in the Cap City. Hope that you had a great day. I know it's been hot the last couple of days, but we are going to get some relief here soon. Tomorrow is supposed to be in the 80s. So if you've been putting off cutting that grass like I have, not wanting to do those honeydews outside, tomorrow will be a good day. If you don't want your wife to uh, know that tomorrow is going to be good, you you better turn off all the televisions and radios because she's going to know that it's going to be in the 80s and you're going to have to be out there just like me. So I won't feel so bad tonight. I am just excited to be back on the air with you once again. I uh, want to thank our sponsors, the G Law Firm, for sponsoring Cruise Inc. Radio 102.8. If you need a set of attorneys that care about your case, and not just about getting you money, but want to get you healed and then uh, make sure that you're highly compensated. You need to call the G Law Firm. You can reach them at 804-226-4111, or you can reach out to them at the G Law Firm, www.glawfirm.com. Again, they have been serving this area for over 30 years, and they care about you. We're excited tonight because this young lady, uh, I first met her when she uh, was uh, running for office, and we had a whole different setup then. Uh, we were on the radio, and I couldn't see that brilliant smile, but you can tell uh, even on the radio that she was just warm, uh, highly intelligent, and very enthusiastic about what she was doing. None other than our delegate uh, for the House of Representatives, Ms. LaSherie Ayers. How you doing? I am fantastic. I'm looking forward to finally catching up with you again. Um, like you said, it has been some time, but um, there's so much good news for us to talk about relative to the work that has been going on here in Virginia. And I just appreciate the invitation to come back. Well, I'm excited because uh, when we did the radio show before, you were on boots on the ground uh, <laughs> that day out uh, canvassing and, and knocking on yes. doors. And you took a few minutes out to talk to us. And so every since then, we've been trying to get you on, especially uh, coming up to uh, election yes. and and making sure that uh, we uh, continue uh, to support. And we were talking about um you know, November coming up here, and you made a mistake. You made a statement <laughs> says if is that what you said? I said if I am to be successful in November. <laughs> okay, well I'm gonna do what I did when you first uh, came aboard and you were running for that office. I said not if, but when, and Thank we're you. saying the same thing now is that uh, they're not gonna remove your name from uh, from your uh, your desk or your office or anything else. We will see you back uh, in that office again uh, after November. The reason I say that, uh, Lasharice, is because you have a phenomenal track record. So 
let's go back to some of the highlights, some of the things that you were able to accomplish in your freshman year uh, as a delegate. <laughs> I know there's been so many things, uh, but what is something that stands out in your mind from that first year that you're extremely proud of that you were able to accomplish? Yeah, this is always a really difficult question to answer because legislation, you you approach them almost like they're small babies that you're birthing because from inception, you know, all the way through uh, until its passage, you're just sort of in love with it and trying to work and mold and build it and get it passed. Um, if I am going to talk about, you know, my, my absolute favorites and probably most impactful, I... I have to be honest and say it wasn't my freshman year, although I had a great freshman year. I was put on, I came in the door, was put on some amazing committees, which is relevant because it allows me to get more done for the communities that I represent. Um, but relative to legislation, uh, there are probably two that stand out. Um, the legislation that I carried and passed that certifies uh, the use of community doulas, um, as well as allow for doulas to be reimbursed. Um, that is significant to me because in the Commonwealth, we have Black women that are dying at higher rates than any other category of women as a result of infant, and, um, infant mortality, um, mm -hmm. infant and maternal mortality, which this legislation will literally save more lives of women, um, but more specifically Black women. Um, this is probably going off on a tangent because you asked for one, but no, I have go to right also, ahead. Um, <laughs> I have to mm -hmm. also name Brianna's law. You know, yes. making Virginia the very first state to, um, you know, ban the use of no-knock search warrants, which is another mechanism that will make sure our communities are safe because they are far more likely to be targeted. Um, but if I'm looking back at this past session probably the most impactful in terms of will just really be a game changer for how we do business here in the Commonwealth for everyday people. It's the resolution we passed declaring, you know, racism a public health crises and not just health from the standard of health care, but from the standard of the social determinants of health your access mm -hmm. to housing, your access to a safe community, your access to the systems that government is responsible for that you interact with that oftentimes have bias in them. So our school systems, I mean, just all of those things that are part of our everyday life, finally affirming that there is a problem with these systems. They are not equitably being applied when it comes to black and brown people and affirming that we must change those systems. Um, there's a long laundry list of legislation that I'm proud of, but I'll just name probably those three as some of the top ones that I'm really, really proud of to date. And, and those are uh, significant. And one thing that COVID has called us, uh, taught us rather, is that we're disenfranchised when it comes to equity, yes. as, uh, uh, you know, from healthcare to uh, some of the, the main things, especially the healthcare among uh, black and brown people. So to put in uh, that type of legislation it, is huge. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, dealing with COVID, how has that been for you know the uh, the General Assembly trying to put in some yeah. uh, some things that will continue to not only um, level out the playing field in the healthcare, but also to address some of the things that are still going on. We still have people that are afraid that they're going to lose their homes. Uh, there's uh, people that are still, especially the elderly, that are disenfranchised because they don't get that access to all of the benefits out there. No, I mean, I think that's a, a great point. It's been, you know, really hard because basically people who were in a really difficult position already to begin with have found themselves in an even worse position as a result of this pandemic. And on the, and, and the other half of that is people who were fine financially have found themselves in hardship that they were not expecting and or um, anticipating, you know, needing to manage through. So some of the things that we've done at the legislative level is just from a relief standpoint, just really try to help people have the resources that they need, especially if they are experiencing a loss in their, you know, revenue with the dollars that they're bringing into their pocket. So things like the child care tax credit, 
um, making sure that if you definitely need child care, that you're not put out of work because you can't get access to child care or you can't afford it. Um, utility relief has been huge. Mm -hmm. um, trying to make sure at least for some period of time, a lot of this has expired um, now or is on the verge of expiring, but trying to make sure that you're not getting any of your utilities disconnected for inability to pay. Um, also rent relief, both for rentals as well as those who have mortgages on rental properties, trying to make sure that they were continuing to receive some um, ability to have grace extended. Um, but furthermore, eviction moratoriums and eviction support. There is probably um, a pot of almost $80 million that the state has set aside to ensure that there is no person in the Commonwealth that should be um, under threat of eviction at this juncture. Um, but then it also allowed us to sort of leapfrog in a way to think about what are those things that we were needing to do anyway that we see right. are uh, disenfranchising people um, and we can use this opportunity to move the Commonwealth ahead. And broadband is certainly one of those examples. In our rural communities, they could not do basic everyday tasks because they were at home, but with no access to internet. And in our small and urban communities, um, the affordability piece played a huge role in whether or not our families had access to being connected. And so we went through just every single uh, relief opportunity that we had, and specifically for small businesses, making sure they had access to grants, especially in the hospitality and restaurant industry, because they were some of the hardest hit. Um, and so from a very high level, those are some of the very foundational things and measures we tried to take. Has it helped uh, Delegate Harris with, uh, you know, the Democrats being uh, in charge of both the House and, and the Senate and also the, uh, the, the governor's mansion uh, to have one, hopefully more bipartisan uh, work on a lot of things and two, getting uh, some of those uh, very uh, important uh, legislation passed? You know, I'm a little biased because I bleed blue, <laughs> but I will say it has just been night and day because there were so many policies that we have been pushing for. If you think back to when I first got elected, uh, Democrats were not in power and we were introducing bill after bill after bill that would really positively benefit our communities and they were dead on arrival. I would have never thought the day would come where we could raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. And while that has not completely happened in Virginia, we passed legislation that would allow it to occur. Um, and we're steadily making progress in that direction. And each year has a designated increase. And while people will say, well, we need that you know, minimum wage increase right away, this is to help uh, small businesses and in this, the industry um, adjust to that increase in the minimum wage. But something like that, that's dollars in everyday families' pockets that they absolutely need. Some of this criminal justice reform that we mm -hmm. could not dare speak of that mostly impacts black and brown communities adversely. To think that we have been able to address many of those at least foundationally over the last two years is huge. Marijuana legalization in Virginia, right. in a Southern state. I mean, these things are finally turning the corner for our communities. And we could never get to this place if we did not have um, the Democratic majority. You know, it, it was just on recently on the uh, one of the newscasts that uh, the arrest rate in terms of uh, marijuana um, has gone down significantly because of you, you had a small um, many a number of people get arrested with small amounts of marijuana. So we've seen about at least a, I think it was 30 to 40 percent decrease in arrest. How significant is that in terms of now uh, not having uh, our systems, which are sometimes already overcrowded, right. even more so uh, not having those uh, those people locked up. 
I mean, at this juncture, that only strengthens our communities, that only strengthens our families, that only strengthens the Commonwealth as a whole, because you, you have more uh, people who are less people who are having their lives negatively impacted and now caught in a web of a system that really makes it far more difficult for them to succeed. And so I, I just I can't say enough about how impactful something like that legislation is having immediately. The fact that you're seeing this and this legislation has like just been put in place um, within the past few years is just phenomenal. Um, you know, I think also most notable because when I was first elected, the one thing that I heard about over and over again was restoration of rights. I mm -hmm. made this mistake in the past. This should not be something that continues to follow me around or prevents me from being able to get meaningful employment. Not only have we made progress on that legislation, but the legislation that we passed just in the 21 session, which allows um, the removal of these charges from your criminal record, you know, um, the expungement legislation that we passed, that's huge. I mean, every single measure that we can take to remove barriers from everyday people as they are trying to do what they can to live a good quality of life, that really is at the core and at the heart of what we should be striving for. I absolutely agree with you because when we look at the economic impact uh, of what that does, one, now we're not housing uh, people who should not be uh, arrested. And two, uh, people are able to go out and, and to apply for jobs and to uh, right. to work, to take care of their families. And that adds, uh, again, It's, a, it's money. intrinsically linked together. Yes, absolutely. And I think sometimes people uh, forget about that and that, you know, in order to continue to turn uh, the tide of Virginia, you know, this is going somewhere with that, we have to be uh, progressive. I want to say kudos to you all uh, for being progressive and looking uh, down at the future, say, hey, if we want to attract uh, larger corporations, if we want to get the, uh, the, uh, the, the best and the brightest to come here right. and, uh, in our city and in our uh, commonwealth to reside, we have to change a lot of things. So uh, Las Reese, uh, you guys have uh, been busy uh, changing <laughs> uh, some history and writing some wrongs. And we just saw uh, a huge one uh, last week with the removal of the uh, Lee Monument. Uh, oh uh, you have been a part of it. What does that do for you to know that it's you were part of that? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's an, it's an out-of-body experience. If you think about the history of, and I get into this debate with people, well, Robert E. Lee was this or he was that. I don't get into that history. I get into what it represents, mm -hmm. regardless of the individual. When it was erected, it was put up for a very specific purpose. And that was to intimidate, to remind, to be a constant symbol of hate. And when I think back to those that were living, when that statue was put high into the sky above right everybody else, especially black people, and to have to walk by that, have to see, have to pour into yourself to not succumb to what that meant and was signaling to you. It's, it is comforting to know that it, is, it has come down, that symbol is no longer there. And as a Commonwealth, former home of the Confederacy, where I personally believe we are significantly responsible for the racism that exists in this country, it is a huge step forward to say, we are not that Commonwealth anymore. And to be able to put our money where our mouths is um, or are to fully demonstrate that. And so it is comforting especially because when I think about the conversations that had to occur to mm -hmm. get to this place, right. um, to know that we landed on the right side of things and are building a new history, telling a new story, um, it feels really good. And, and, it's, and it's not the thing that will, you know, put food on your table or keep your lights on, but it all matters. It all 
uh, has something to do with who we are as a people as we are in the Commonwealth of Virginia. You, and you're absolutely right. Uh, this, uh, when you have the world watching uh, the removal of that statue, that tells you how monumental it was yes. and, and the impact that it, that it has around the world. Uh, you know, I was watching Roland Martin and, and just all the, uh, the Washington Post, everybody, CNN was locked here in yes. Richmond. And so uh, it goes back again to where we are making some changes that again i think that's going to be sweeping uh across the the nation and i'm so glad that i live uh at a time and, and a place to be a part of that history and see these changes uh come about you know i didn't ever think i'd be allowed to see the first yeah. african-american uh president and here we are and, and now see, we're sweeping the pot <laughs> yeah absolutely so uh this is uh, again Thank you all for having that foresight and that tough conversation because sometimes tough conversations are not always pleasant. You know, <laughs> people of- always people often ask me, you know, how especially at the heart of social unrest, I would often get asked, how are you doing? Are you holding up okay? Like almost anticipating that I would be overwhelmed or sad. And these things that were occurring and these battles that we are fighting one by one you know, they can be overwhelming. But I tell people, I'm thriving in this moment. Can you imagine a better time than this to actually affect the change we have been talking about for so long? I I believe this is not an or moment. This is an and more moment. I want to change this, this, and this. And if we can't (laughs) get it done now, we will never be able to get it done. So I've got a laundry list of things to work on and we are just getting started. You know, a lot of this legislation that we have passed, this is the stuff that was on pent up demand, but we have not gotten even close to where we have to go to really be able to say we live in an equitable commonwealth. Um, And those are the things we will continue to be talking about and fighting for. Absolutely. I'm looking at the clock here. I was like, oh my God, we we reached that that oh. point. But uh, <laughs> uh, a couple more uh, points yeah. here. Uh, in terms of uh, black and brown people, how much responsibility actually comes on us, uh, La Charisse, as making sure that we stay vocal, uh, we stay vigilant? Uh, what, in your opinion, how much of that uh, of that honest is on us? All of it. <laughs> I, I, I'm so glad you brought this up because there's two really important points that I want to make. Number one, even during the heart of social unrest, I attribute the progress that we made, not just on the fact that these are some of the things that, you know, have been demanded and that we have been pushing for all along. But when you think about the height of citizen participation, activists, protesters, they have their foot on our necks to act for lack of a better uh, reference. They were unapologetic. They were not going to let up and they wanted to see this change happen. And for black leaders, and let's just be real about it. That's easy because we, this is the, these are the things we want to see happen and do anyway. But right. that is not the norm across the board. Even when it comes to Democrats, Some of these issues they do not understand, they are not familiar with, and they had to be brought along. But we had the cover to push for some of that to happen because the public demand, especially from black people, brown people, was so intense that there was no way you could say, I can't understand the need for this. And as I just said a minute ago, we have only scratched the foundation of the progress, not only that we need, but that we should be demanding. And the moment that that pressure is no longer applied and people feel comfortable, Republicans, Democrats, no matter who you are, when they feel like, oh, we've checked every box, there is not more to to do, it becomes that much more difficult to continue to build that foundation of progress. And so we need people to continue to stay engaged, to continue to be unapologetic about their demands and to hold us proudly and others accountable. And because I'm an elected official who's on the ballot in November, I have to say the easiest first step that they can do is vote. This year, we have made voting so accessible, so easy. Early voting begins on Friday, and that will go all September the 17th, 
all the way through October the 30th. I mean, I remember going into a registrar's office to try and vote early and you have to pick one of those reasons. Hmm, which one actually applies? <laughs> no right. excuse absentee voting, early voting, requesting your ballot, putting it in a Dropbox mail. I mean, all of these tools have been made available for us to vote. And the first group of people that will be harmed, should they not vote and should the administration turn over, it's going to be us. These criminal justice reforms, the legalization, uh, the relief, these things will be undone before you can blink an eye. And if we do not show up on November the 3rd, we'll be looking around trying to figure out what happened. So, yes, it is on us. It is our responsibility. Um, and, and, and I just plead with people to not feel comfortable I can have a whole session on what's happening at the federal level and how we are feeling a little too comfortable right now. But for the sake of time and for this program, I'm just going to say our work is not done. We have so much more to do and we need people to stay engaged. Man, I am just, uh, God, I'm sitting here, you know, because uh, there's so much and my head is just about to explode, but uh, I'm going to try we'll to do, to do this. part two. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Because again, this this is an important election. People don't need to understand, yeah, the presidential elections, they are important, but what impacts us in these localities are yes. getting out and voting for our delegates, uh, in the House for the Senate, uh, we have the sheriff's race. We have oh uh, the Commonwealth Attorney's race. I mean, yeah, the and things you see and feel that impacts you directly happens at the local level. And when you look around at what is happening in other states, if you think that can't be Virginia, think again. Absolutely. That's we see what's going on down in, in Georgia and what they're trying to do there and voter suppression and uh, what have you. So we can't go backwards. We've made too much no. progress. We definitely going to have to do a part two because <laughs> there's so, so much. Uh, that, We're just you know, getting warmed up. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I was about to stoke the flames here, but I'm, I'm going to say something because it, it's some see, things that's that. Favorite, uh, so you're definitely going to have to invite me back. We're gonna have to well, uh, take take off your peace hat, get into the politics, all all the the uh, the interesting conversations that people want to hear about. Yeah, because <laughs> there's a a lot, and we want to say this as always. You know, uh, we love you, and uh, we are gonna go out on the limb again, like we did uh, 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 what almost twelve years ago. Is it? It's four years. Every four years. Every, every two, two years. Two years for me. It's, Okay, every two years. So then, uh, so if eight back years in 15, ago, 16 was it? Either 15 yeah. or 16. Yeah, well, I'm mad to get that. But anyway, I made a prediction that yes. you were going to win. And then the next two years, I made a, another prediction you were going to yes, win. And I am going to make it here <laughs> tonight and say, right, I, I'm, I'm 10 and 1 when it comes to us uh, yes. endorsing and because we endorse people that we believe in. Uh, that we know that we'll get the job done, that's sincere. And you have done that. You have a, you. a proven track record. Uh, I don't care what rock you turn over, you're <laughs> going to see nothing but positive things that you've done. And we appreciate your service. We appreciate you. your hard work, your tenacity, and not uh, and not uh, giving up or either giving in. I am so grateful for that. Thank you for the opportunity to be a guest again on your show. And I'll be waiting to set up part two. Uh, we're coming back in November, right after you have your uh, your victory celebration and everything. Okay. <laughs> then we're coming back and we're going we gonna to dig down into the crates about some things. Let's do it. Thank you so, so much for having me. Thank you as well. Have a great evening. All right, everybody, we had an opportunity again to uh, talk with the wonderful uh, delegate, La Charite Ayers, uh, stopping by and visiting with us. It, it has kind of become a tradition uh, for us to have her here, so we're glad that during her busy schedule, in fact, she had to leave to go to another appointment. So we're going to have her back again. We're going to talk about uh, the uh, the gun laws, the common sense gun laws. We're going to talk about uh, the complacency of some of the uh, the Democrats and how uh, and even among Democrats that 
uh, we can be our own worst enemy. So we're going to get into some of those topics. Uh, we're going to talk about the, the gun violence. We really didn't have a chance to dig down into that. But the main thing that I want to say that you need to get out and vote. Uh, early voting starts uh, September the 17th, which is uh, this Friday, two days from today. Uh, go out and vote because there are a lot of important uh, things on the agenda. We have uh, the race for the governor. We know that we have Terry McCullough and uh, Young and that's running. And if we don't want to undo all of the progress that we've been able to make in uh, this city and the Commonwealth, you need to get out and vote. We have the Commonwealth's attorney uh, for the city of Richmond. We have the sheriff for the city of Richmond. So uh, again, all these are important. And we had that big referendum about uh, Casino uh, One uh, and the result that's uh, up uh, again on the ballot. So, uh, you know, vote yes. I'm saying vote yes. The reason I'm saying vote yes is not necessarily for the gambling because I know some people have heartaches about the gambling. But when you look past the gambling and look at all the other benefits of having a, a first class resort in this area uh, and a lot of other features and activities and entertainment that's going to bring, uh, again, revenue to this city, then I would say, you know, uh, you're going to vote, uh, vote yes uh, for that referendum to pass uh, so that we can have a casino here in our area. Um, I am going to go ahead. I was going to open up the, the phone lines uh, tonight. I wanted to talk about uh, some of the, the violence over the last 24 hours, we've had uh, about four juveniles that have been uh, involved in shooting. So uh, again, uh, in fact, what I'm going to do, I would like for a few minutes, if you're out and still watching the, the program, uh, call in and I will take your calls and we will talk about uh, the, the gun violence here in our city because um, we're almost up to uh, 60 homicides at this time. Uh, unfortunately, last night, a uh, young man uh, body was discovered uh, in the South side and uh, another family has been impacted by the violence in the city. So I'm gonna, for the next few minutes, I'm gonna open up the, the phone lines and I'm gonna put the number up here. I would like for you to come in I'll uh, call in and talk about the, the violence in Richmond. We have about 15 minutes, so I'm going to devote uh, the 15 minutes to talking about, uh, again, the violence in Richmond. So I'm going to go take a commercial, and I will be right back, and we will talk about uh, the violence here in our city. Each case is totally different. I can't give you an exact time frame of how long it will take your case, but I can explain how long it takes based on phases. The first phase is your treatment phase. I don't know how long it takes you to get well, but that's the first phase. The second phase is a phase where we're gathering medical records, medical bills and everything and sending it to the insurance company for processing. The third phase deals with negotiations. Sometimes that's short, sometimes that's long. Negotiations break down, we're into the trial process. If you file your case in the General District Court, you'll probably have a hearing in about four or five months. Those cases cannot get any more than $25,000. If you file your case in the Circuit Court, the sky's the limit. You can ask for any amount you want. It will take between eight to 10 months to get a verdict. Understand that at any point through this process, your case can settle. There's still settlement negotiations going on even though the court process is working. So if a case settles, the court process is over. The most important part is for the client to treat with his or her doctor and get well. We will take care of everything else.
All right, welcome back, everybody. This is Cruz with Cruz Inc. Radio 102.8 TV Live. Uh, we just had Delegate LaCherise Air on with us. Um, she's back up for election. So, again, we're asking that you will support her so that she may continue the great work that she's doing for the House of Representatives um, for, uh, again, uh, the General Assembly here in the Commonwealth. I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about uh, the violence in Richmond. I wanted to get your opinions on it. What do you think are some of the things that uh, we can do, the city can do, uh, the community can do uh, to slow down uh, violence in Richmond, to reduce the violence in Richmond? So if you have a thought about this, you can reach me now at 804-601-0281. Again, that's 804-601-0281. Eight one. Uh, just within the last 24 hours, we've had um, two youth, uh, not two, but actually four. Uh, we had two that was uh, shot last night in Creighton Court. And just uh, on Monday night, you had uh, uh, two teens that were shot in Woodland Crossing. And as I was uh, showing last night, uh, the discovery of uh, a young man who had been uh, shot. They discovered his body on last night. But we are, again, approaching 60 homicides in the city of Richmond. And I'd like to hear from you your thoughts on how we can start to impact the crime in our city. The number to call while we're online is 804-601-0281. 6010281. Uh, what are your opinions? What are your thoughts? Uh, in the meantime, I'd like to thank the G Law Firm for uh, their sponsorship of Cruise Inc. Radio and Cruise Inc. Media. We certainly uh, appreciate that. And if you're looking for a great venue to uh, have an event, whether it's a wedding or wedding reception or a small party, then you need to contact Miss Angela Knight. Uh, for occasions by AK. You can reach her at 804-874-6681. Uh, again, that's uh, occasions by AK, and that number is 804-874-6681. If you want to contact the G Law Firm, it's 804-226-4111. Again, G Law Firm, they care about you. I also want to mention uh, again that we are uh, accepting sponsorships. If you'd like to have your name, uh, of course, read and your business read uh, in our openings and also in our closings and throughout our broadcast and also on our 24-7 radio station, you can give us a call at 804-601-0281. Or you can email us at cruisingradio at gmail.com. Our website, you can always go out to our website and see what we're doing. Uh, the website is cruisingradio.com. That's cruisingradio.com. Uh, go out and listen to some of the great music that we have. We play R&B, jazz, gospel. We have uh, the Barry Farmer Morning Show. We got the BJ uh, Murphy show. We have urban news. We have some great, great uh, radio personalities on each and every day. Uh, again, we're 24 seven around the clock, uh, nothing but quality programming. And I would ask you to go out there and support us. And if you want to be a part of our continual growth and what we're doing with cruising radio 102.8, then please, by all means, uh, support us. Well, it's about 810. And uh, again, wanted to uh, talk with some of you all. Maybe we'll schedule this again where we were talking about gun violence. Uh, some other things that we're going to be talking about is mental health. And we're also going to get into uh, support for veterans. You know, there are a lot of veterans out here that uh, don't get the needed support uh, that they should be. They've served this country. Uh, they come home and, and unfortunately, uh, many of our veterans are uh, 
not able to get the support that they need. And you would think that uh, our veterans and our, our elderly, elderly community would be some of the first people that get the assistance that they need. We have some uh, seniors that are making choices of whether or not to buy food or to buy medicine. This is the United States. Those things should not be a part of our narrative. It should really upset us that once you work so long uh, here in the United States and you get ready to finally retire and you get in your social security, you have to pay for your uh, for your services. These things, again, we spend so much money helping other countries, but we uh, seem to be lax when it comes to helping those that need help the most. So again, these are just some of the topics we're going to be uh, talking about in the near future here. Uh, we're going to be having more guests coming on. So um, really thank you all for being with us, supporting us throughout these 11 years. And we're going to continue to work hard to bring you quality programming. And I just want to say before I leave, I'll give another opportunity. If you uh, want to uh, leave a comment about uh, the violence here in Richmond, or you want to call in, I have the phone lines open right now. The number is at the bottom. You can call me at 804-601-0281. If you have a thought or a comment about the violence here in our city, again, we are approaching almost 60 homicides. We average in the city of Richmond 60 homicides a year, and this is just September. So uh, at the rate we're going, we're going to surpass that 60, uh, the average of 60 homicides in this city. Well, everybody, again, appreciate you uh, tuning in and uh, want to again thank uh, Delegate LaCherise Ayers for stopping by and kind of giving us an update of what's going on. Remember, early voting starts September the 17th, this Friday, and goes all the way up to October the 31st. So you have plenty of time to go out and vote. And then uh, November the 3rd, of course, is the election day. Thanks, everybody. You all have a great night. This is your boy Cruz, the Beast from the East, Cruz at Radio 102.8 TV Live. We'll catch you. <laughs> we'll catch you next time. As I always say, whatever comes from the heart reaches the heart. Let somebody know how much you care for them and how much you love them. Good night, guys. Oh